from the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, we have them free for you at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Is Bigfoot lurking in the forests of Western North America? Well, you know my opinion on this. According to Nate Rudd and Rich Germo, our guests tonight, the Sasquatch is very real and very aware of its surroundings. Now, Nathan was born and raised in Spokane Valley, Washington. He's a good Chiefs fan. Yes, he is. He likes his Spokane Chiefs, even though they haven't won the Memorial Cup in, let's see, I think it was 1991, the last time they did. Pat Falloon, Trevor Kidd in goal. Oh, yeah. I know that. Hold on, Nate. See, I remember this stuff, okay? Link Gates on defense. Oh, yeah, but he wasn't playing at that point. Anyways, he spent most of his life doing two things. Working in the beer business and searching for Sasquatch. The last seven years, Nate started investigating Sasquatch with his son, Corey, and brother-in-law, Chris. And, you know, joining us also is Rich Germo. Over 14 years of law enforcement, local, federal, and tribal experience, Rich was assigned roles in everything from patrol and detective division to SWAT and Marine Enforcement. Man, this guy's a badass. Just a badass. Rich's first experience with Sasquatch was in year 2000, the month of July, in La Push, Washington, while on duty as a La Push tribal police officer. We're going to find out about that. He's also co-founded the Olympic Project with Derek Randalls. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire, brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. Nate Rudd, good to have you here, my friend. How are you doing? Oh, thanks for having me back, Dave. It's always a pleasure. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Doing good. You too, my friend. Hey, Spokane Chiefs, how's that for history? How is that? Brad oh, Ferentz was you got a memory. Brad Ferentz was always Link also Gates. on defense there. Yeah, I remember Link Gates. Uh, I remember one game where uh they, they dropped the puck and uh, it was an instant fight uh, before the before the oh, game yeah. even started. He was fighting. You know what? Oh yeah, that guy was a fighter. Let me tell you a little story about Link. All right. Okay. My dad he was with the New Westminster Bruins. And he got sent down okay. because he was drinking during training camp. So he got sent down to my dad's <laughs> team, and that's how I got to know him. All right? And, oh, okay. And and so anyways, next thing you know, he gets traded to Spokane. You know, Troy Gamble was your goaltender back then. Remember Troy Gamble? Okay. He was a good goaltender. Yeah. Would have been would have yeah. been great in the NHL for the Canucks if he hadn't got into concussion problems. Took a couple of slap shots to the head. But that's okay. That's okay. Rich, are you a hockey fan too? Are you excited about uh, your Seattle Kraken? Actually, I'm not a hockey fan, but I apologize. I don't really know a whole lot about hockey. Well, you're going to learn with the Kraken I'm, there, my friend. My seven-year-old son, that's his favorite team now because he loves the Kraken. So now I'm going to have to drive really? him down to Seattle to catch a game. So that's okay. I, that's a good trip. That's that's good money well spent in my son's investing in my son's hockey future. Because I'm hoping within nine years he's good enough that I could kick him out of the house and send him to live somewhere, go play junior hockey somewhere. But that's another story for another day. Gentlemen, we are here to talk Bigfoot tonight. And, you know, Rich, you're new to this show. We know a little bit about Nate. We'll get to him in a minute. Tell us about your sighting in July of 2000 that really changed your life. Well, I was a cop in La Push. Uh, I was on my way into work. I was working swing shift that day. Um, so I was coming in. Actually, was I? No, I was on Graveyard, actually, that later on. Uh, I was coming in. It was later in the evening, about 7 p.m., um, I was coming down La Push Road past the housing areas, uh, past the Second Beach parking area, which is uh, uh, is the um, the Park Service. Yes, not Force Service. It's Park Service. 
coming around the corner past the housing area, past the park service, and you're coming straight down the hill towards uh, Lonesome Creek. There's a store down there, and then there's La Push Beach, and a lot of people camp and surf down there. Well, I was coming down the hill, and I got about, you know, 50, 60, 70 yards from Lonesome Creek where it crosses the road, and this thing pops out on the left side of the road right in the brush where the creek is. And I'm still going towards it, and about when it gets halfway in the road, I probably stop. So I was maybe 50 yards from it then, and it took like four steps, just kind of didn't wasn't running. It just swiftly kind of glided across the road really eloquently, just four steps, and then disappeared right on the fence line in the brush. Uh, and that was pretty much the sighting, you know. I was shocked for a minute, you know, because I was a trained observer, and I'm just sitting there in the road, which... which what seems like forever, but it was probably only a second, you know, no cars are coming. There's no other people visually in the road, you know, walking or anything like that. And, um, I'm trying to place this thing in a, in a specific, in a box because, you know, I'm a trained observer and I, I'm trained to identify things yet. It's not really coming together because I know what it is, but it's not supposed to be real, and I keep trying to bounce it into a known box, and it's bouncing out until I just kind of accept it real quick, and then I continue on my path to work after the shock wears off real quick, and, uh, you know, I start feeling, you know, kind of like I'm betrayed a little bit after uh, I keep going because, you know, I'm a trained observer. I was a cop. I was in the military. I was in the Marine Reserves for five years, too, and I was still in at that time. I dedicated pretty much my life to public service and um, sworn oath to protect, you know, the government and and uh, people's rights and everything. And uh, how come I wasn't given knowledge about this? And I was kind of um, offended a little bit. Like I said, I felt like I had been betrayed by the country, essentially, that I swore to, to uh, uphold, to protect, you know, and... Um, it took me a while to, uh, well, I never did. In fact, uh, I was just, you know, I, 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 I started asking a lot of questions why on a lot of different issues related to my job and, and just things in general. I started to question everything, I think, after that. Um, but that's, yeah, that's pretty much my sighting, the first one. I got to ask you, being a tribal police officer, you know, were you not forewarned by your fellow tribal police that the Sasquatch was very real? No. Okay. Here. Okay. Here's the deal. Lapush. They didn't really talk about it much down there. When I worked down in Lapush, you know, none of the cops I worked with were tribal members. Uh, some of the fish cops were, but none of the. I think there were five or six of us, and we were all uh, non-tribal members. Um, I had heard a little bit about it, actually, from my sergeant, just a little bit, because uh, he said that um, he had told me before when I was new that sometimes late at night, teenagers will come pound on their door and tell them that they had gotten run out of the cemetery by Stick Indian, which is um, a name that they reference for Bigfoot, and uh, he wouldn't take them seriously or anything like that. But it just so happens the one that I saw was headed towards the cemetery, actually. And, you know, here, here's the thing, you know, I think that the tribe, the tribal members, because I, I wasn't afraid to tell people, even then, it, the word spread pretty quick. And, you know, they made fun of me more than anybody did. <laughs> so, uh, and it wasn't that, I think they just razzed me because they knew it was probably real and they could poke at me for it. You know, in fact, I was at a... Uh, Soon after that, I was at some kind of a, I think it was a Quilly Days Festival, possibly. It was right after that, where they have a big carnival down there and fireworks and everything. And I had three Indian kids run up next to me. They wanted me to be able to hear them, and they talked about they saw three Bigfoots get into a UFO and fly away, and they laughed and ran off. And uh, so it's, you know, I didn't seem to bother. It didn't bother me much. But, but what was interesting is that I had three or four tribal members come in late at night, you know, when I was working graveyard and confide in me and, and tell me their stories of what happened and, and stuff. And, and one of the, uh, actually the fish cops showed me a bunch of pictures he took of a bunch of tracks he found. Uh, well, he was just driving down a fresh logging road and stopped at a landing and got out and, and saw a bunch of big 15, 16 foot impressions in the mud. 
Incredible. But that's about it. Mm-hmm. In- incredible. What was your belief, Rich, in the Sasquatch before you had this sighting? I didn't have one. You know, I grew up uh, watching Unsolved <laughs> Mysteries and, and uh, with Leonard Nimoy and, and some of the other shows where they had Bigfoot and, and you'd see the Patterson Gimlin film every every now and again on the documentary channels and I was intrigued by it. I was a kid. I thought it would be one. It would be great if something like that was real. But I didn't seriously believe that it was that possible, just because of the mere fact that the way that I think, and you know, I'm not a stupid person, and, and I seem I look at things in a big picture. You know, I kind of look at all aspects of it, and and I always considered the the reality that you know the United States government, you know, has um, a lot of uh, money capabilities. And one thing that I would know would have known based on my military and my law enforcement experience, even at that time, was that if if you had an undocumented like humanoid that was roaming around North America, that would be a threat to national security. And knowing what I know about the United States government, it would exhaust every available resource that it had at its disposable disposal to find out everything that it possibly could about this. And it never told us anything about it. So um I didn't think something like that could be possible because there's no way that something like that could evade the technology that the United States has in its corner, you know, whatever, what other assets it has as well. I mean, it would be able to find out as much as it possibly could. And, you know, one thing later on that uh, I kind of realized when I thought about this is when you look at Bigfoot researchers in general, I mean, there's, And Bigfoot, in general, the topic, you know, there's thousands of eyewitness accounts in the United States, throughout the world. Historically, it goes back thousands of years. I mean, there's, there is uh, documented cave art and other stuff that depicts it. Um, I don't really know of any researchers that have been questioned by U.S. Fish and Wildlife or any other U.S. intelligence agency about the topic. So that would tell me that they know more than anybody else knows because they don't talk to anybody or ask them any questions. And uh, they don't divulge anything, and they have disclosed zero related to the topic. So it tells you a lot in itself. It really does. It really does. Nate, I want to bring you in here because you were on a few months ago and really impressed our audience with not only your participation, but the fact that you have, you know, done some very, very ethical and and honest research into this field. And and you don't know what the hell it is you're looking for, but you're trying. You're trying hard. So for our new listeners that have come in and may not have heard the show that you did previously with me talking about Bigfoot, what was your first encounter and how did that change your life? Well, Dave, uh, boy, that was, I, I enjoyed listening to Rich, I think as much as everyone else in the, in the audience, but, uh, you know, I haven't actually had a sighting yet. Uh, we've been real close to him many times. Um, had some hair raising encounters. Uh, the first experience I had was I had a rock thrown at me up in the, uh, ancient Cedar forest up above priest Lake, Idaho. Um, we just kind of went out on a whim one night. We were kind of a little bit bored up at the lake and, and, uh, you know, I, I told the story here before, but, uh, asked Chris kind of half joking. I think that, Hey, you want to go look for Bigfoot? It was kind of getting later. It was dark. So, uh, he kind of looked at me and said, really? Well, yeah, let's do it. So yeah, we ended up going up at night and, uh, took some flashlights and a couple sidearms and went, proceeded to hike into the ancient cedar forest up there. It's, uh, it's a pretty majestic place. It's way above priest there, uh, kind of close to the Canadian border and kind of did that hike up in there. And about halfway up, uh, we, we heard a rock land right in front of us and, uh, it kind of shocked us, you know, first time out, didn't expect anything to happen probably. And we just had a rock thrown at us and we pushed through that and, uh, hiked all the way in there. And I think, uh, I did my first call ever just kind of, you know, uh, watching the shows and stuff, kind of did my best, uh, job at that. It probably sounded funny, but right after that call, we, we got a huge crash. Sounded like, uh, the best way I could describe it is you know, like a giant tree hit another tree, just exploding. And this was probably about midnight, 1230. And what you got to realize is how remote this place is. It's a, it's an actual, uh, national park, but 
we went up there. There was no other cars in the parking lot, and you got to hike in, and it's a pretty good hike uphill, probably a couple miles in there. And uh, like I said, it was about midnight, so we knew there was no one down below, no other humans there, and having a couple things like that happen, you know, it, it shocks you. Um, we pushed through it, and, and that was our first experience, uh, kind of having a rock thrown at us. So uh, kind of got us hooked from there. We we couldn't believe it, and you know we've been doing it ever since. I never knew what it was like to have a rock thrown at me, okay, until it happened a couple of weeks ago. And me and my buddy Mike, we were out uh, at our original gifting site, and we were you know coming out of the out of the forest and we were right by our vehicle and we try and do everything the same okay i park in the exact same spot i i make sure that i i talk a little bit louder so they know it's my voice if they're around okay i try and do things the same and we came out of the bush there was nothing moved at our gifting site or anything like that and actually there was pardon me there was nothing that we had put there that had moved, but there was a a really long eight foot branch of a tree that had been shoved in between a couple of other trees. There was just no way it could have fallen in there. All right. So that was a little bit unique and interesting. So we come out of the forest and we're right. Uh, we walked past my vehicle to the other side of the of the gravel road looking because there was a trail going up there and we just wanted to check that trail. And as we were standing there with our backs towards the vehicle, we hear the, the clap, you know, that clacking sound that two rocks make. It's very familiar. And it was only one. I said to Mike, I said, did you hear that? He goes, yep. I said, that sounded like a rock hitting a rock, dude. And he's like, absolutely. That's exactly what it was. And Mike's a real outdoorsman. He, he And I, you know, he's one of those guys that you just feel safe with in the forest. And I'll tell you, it, it kind of was, we stood there. We were just getting ready to leave. We stood there for about another 45 minutes just trying to make it happen again. And it didn't. But that it, that's okay. At least it finally happened. Finally happened. I'm happy about that. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting experience. Have you ever had one thrown at you, Rich? Uh, one time. I don't know if it's, but um, I was setting cameras at a location uh, that I refer to as Dow Mountain. It was private property adjacent to a housing development up by Lake Cushman, and uh, this guy had taken me into this little spot behind his house. It was um, in a little canyon, kind of or a waterfall area where this creek comes through in this solid kind of basalt basin. And uh, there's a kind of a drop-off on one side, and you have to climb across the other side and kind of repel off some trees, not real far down. And I was hanging off of these trees, setting up these cameras, because I thought that it'd be, like, guaranteed, because these things were coming into this area pretty regularly. And I was setting these cameras on it, and uh, while I was setting them, I had small rocks whizzing by me, and I could hear them go, pew! And they'd hit the rocks beside me and bounce off, but it wasn't hitting me, and I and I couldn't tell where they were coming from either, because I was kind of down in a hole, and there was uh, brush all around me, and it could have come from like four different directions, but and I couldn't see any, I couldn't, I didn't see anything, and I didn't hear anything approach, but there's running water and everything going too, but I could hear the rocks like, if you know the sound I'm talking about, somebody shot one out of a slingshot and you heard it go by you, you know. Yeah, it kind, of like, kind of does that zing, yeah. Yeah, and it would bounce off the rocks around me. And then I went back the next day, I believe, or it might have been a couple of days, but all my cameras had been... I had I used to use pantyhose to put over the cameras because it was really good camouflage, and you could stick stuff in them, in it. And then I would rip little holes in the pantyhose for the lenses and stuff and for the infrared. But it really did a great job because you could stick sticks in it and integrate moss and like totally hide them. So they couldn't be seen, but the next day I showed up and all the cameras, camouflage was ripped off, and the cameras had been moved on the trees, and that was on the side of the bluff. So they hung over the side somehow, I don't know how they did it, and uh, exposed all my cameras, moved them, there was no pictures of anything, except some false triggers, and that was it. Guys, we need to wow, talk about cool. that. We need to talk about that. How the heck is it that every Sasquatch investigator slash researcher who goes out in the field always has their trail cams messed with one way or another. How is that possible? We got about three minutes left. 
before we go to break. It's it's true. It's true, Dave. Yeah, we. Uh, I haven't used uh, cameras like Rich has. He's done a lot of that. Um, but w- that experience we had in hunting camp, about halfway through that week, we set up those two, one behind the tent and then one on a tree that kind of faced the middle of camp there where the tree was, the big tree was pushed over. And um, they both malfunctioned. The one behind the tent where we got the growls and all the wood knocks and stuff um, took like white pictures. I, I don't know how to, else to describe it. It was like a cloudy, milky white picture, but it never, and it would take pictures like the next day of a squirrel, but it, at nighttime it would malfunction. And then the other one should have caught that big tree that fell over right in the middle of camp. But uh, we checked that the next morning, I believe, or when we got back and it got light the next morning. And there was a dead moth placed over the eye of the lens backwards, like it was kind of crunched up on the lens, and the moth was backwards. So uh, I don't know how to explain that, but uh, yeah, yeah. So that was our experience with uh, with the cameras, but uh, we haven't had much luck with them with either. And I don't know how they avoid them. Rich, Uh, how do you think they do it? Uh, oh, hang on. I mean, what manipulate the cameras? Yeah. Uh, um, well, you know, I've had some luck. I had some luck with cameras early, and then not a lot of luck. And I had, you know, I've had cameras messed with a few times, and I've always had all. all, all I've also had some strange anomalies happen with cameras with batteries going dead and stuff like that, brand new ones. And I mean, I have a few different stories related to weird. I don't know how they. I don't know how they can even find them. I don't know how they are, know where they're at in many of these cases where. I've hidden them so well that there's no possible way they can know, but they always seem to know. But I have a really, I have some really crazy stuff. I have a couple of crazy stories. If you got time for me to tell them about well, cameras, y- y- you know what? Well, let's get to them when we get back from the break here, because I don't want the you to get started and, and then all of a sudden we have to cut out to a commercial break in a few seconds. But I definitely want to hear them because this isn't the first time. A lot of researchers that I have talked to, they're not even bothering putting out the cameras anymore because they just get manipulated somehow and it's almost like there's a human smell on them or maybe they can their acute hearing can hear the camera turning on and off i don't know that is one of the big mysteries yeah that is one of the big mysteries that we need to try and find out as we are talking bigfoot tonight On Spaced Out Radio, Sasquatch researchers from Washington State. We have Nathan Rudd from Spokane, from the Seattle area. We have Rich Germeau from the Olympic Project. This is real-time Bigfoot talk tonight as we turn up the woo just for you on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. 
Hey, everybody. The SOR of Space Travelers is open. For just 5 bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. If you like it hot, real hot then heat up your meals with bumblefoot hot sauce get your bumblefoot hot sauce today the sauce bumblelicious and the four million scoville unit bumble we're going in hot real hot coming out even hotter keep the milk nearby and tantalize your taste buds tonight bumblefoot hot sauce available now at kajans.com Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello, Space Travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. For more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. We're taking Sunday nights out of this world on Spaced Out Radio. This is Michael W. Hall, also known as the Paranormal Lawyer. Together, we're going to go on an exciting journey into the unknown. I'm going to bring you some of the best interviews in the paranormal and supernatural to start your new week off on a freaky note. So tune in to Spaced Out Sundays with me, Michael W. Hall, only on SpacedOutRadio.com. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I'm your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we are talking Bigfoot all night long. We have 
two Washington State researchers, Nathan Rudd from Spokane and out of the Seattle area, Rich Germo. Gentlemen, welcome back. And Rich, you were going to tell us some interesting stories about trail cams because for some reason, everybody who sets up trail cams looking for Sasquatch always ends up one way or another having them tinkered with. All right, well, I'll start out and tell you a little bit about my experience with them. So we started this Olympic project, me and Derek Randalls, and we had a benefactor, Wally Hurston, who paid for our equipment, uh, and among other things. And um, in particular, uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. I could take in uh, vacation, and uh, I took sick leave, and um, I had three days off a week, too. I was probably spending about 30 hours of field time a week at that time. It started probably in 2000, well, this started in 2009, and went on probably like you know, about four years, probably about with that consistency, maybe three and a half, and then it tapered off. Um, but I had about 50 cameras, Reconnex. I started out with the big Reconnexes, and then we got the, down to these smaller ones that were more modern. But I don't even know what they have now because I don't even mess with them anymore. Uh, rechargeable batteries, and then I used lithiums too, um, which would give about 13 uh, months. Double A lithiums would do about 13 months of use, up to 10,000 pictures, with with what the cards were capable of at that time. At those cameras were about 550 bucks a piece. Uh, they were about the best ones that you could get, and they had a, like a uh, a cloaked uh, infrared signature. You could see it uh, with night vision, or uh, I mean, it was real faint with the lights off, but it had some sort of a filter on it that blocked the infrared so it didn't flash to the human eye at least. So, um, started out doing these cameras all over the place, uh, up in the Olympics, utilizing uh, travel routes. Um, I would basically take an area, look at uh, BFRO Flats page, which is the sighting database where all the reports go, try to find spots with historical sightings, uh, over a long period of time that was repeated, then try to find, lo- find locations that were adjacent to each other that uh, required crossing specific um, areas to get to the other area. Uh, and then I would look at the topo maps and then figure out how terrain was going to dictate travel and then start hiking up into those areas looking for air signs and placing cameras and then leaving for six months to a year or sometimes come back sooner. But it just so happens that one of the first places that I really went into was uh, the Hamahama area off of Mount Washington, and I was referred to that area by a guy named John Chrisman, who was a longtime researcher from the 50s to the 90s. Um, there's not much information left about him on the Internet because he kind of existed before the era of the Internet. But he's well known by, uh, he was uh, Grover Krantz, who was in tight with him, and Jeff Meldrum from earlier and stuff like that. Guy is, was a vast research. He knew had tons of stuff. Followed a group of Sasquatch around that area for 45, 50 years, a group of five. He got identified by tracks. He found over 1,300 tracks in there and hair and everything else you could think of. Um, but anyway, so I went up into this area and had success pretty early up off of Mount Washington, off of a ridge. Went up there with this guy named Shaky that was part of our project, uh, Brian Rasmussen. And uh, he was an iron worker, and we hiked up, found tracks right away, going up there on top of the at 4,000 feet, found some more impressions in the um, moss around the mountain heather and stuff. And we ended up placing uh, the camera at this site that I had researched on a saddle where another finger comes up and goes over. And uh, went back about a month and a half later and saw that the camera had been moved to the side. This camera was right in the wide open. It was on a small tree and about 12 inches diameter cameras probably placed about five and a half feet high. So I saw the camera was slightly moved. We check the card, leave, or pull the card out, replace it, leave, and I get home, and sure enough, there's pictures of a Sasquatch on it. Uh, so the squash, uh, Sasquatch, it shows you the Sasquatch moving the camera. Um, it's on no the way. Olympic Project website. Yeah, it's the, the pictures are on the uh, Olympic Project website under, I think, unidentif- unidentified or something like that. Um, it, it doesn't say on the text in there that I took DNA swabs off the camera and I got positive results out of out of that. That was part of the Sasquatch genome project. I think it was and I find it's a male Sasquatch. Uh, I think there's a sequence of four or five photographs 
where you see one of them where you can see the um, left deltoid muscle where it comes down and the elbow's bent up and it's got its hand on the camera, and I think that's where it moves the camera first. Then it disappears out of frame and goes around the tree and shows up in front of the camera again, but looks like what's knelt down. And you can see its arm is bent and it catches a couple of its fingers in the frame. Uh, and then I think there's two pictures of its face right up in the camera where they're kind of blurry. They're, all of them are not that great at pictures, just like all Bigfoot pictures, but we were able to figure out what it was pretty easy. And, you know, a lot of people still don't see it, but I don't know how they don't. But go to the webpage and look if you want to, to the people out there watching. It's on the Olympic Project website. Uh, it's under unidentified pictures. I'm not sure. And then there's a bunch of text that I wrote that goes with each picture describing it to you, so it's easier to see. And I can tell you with the face pictures, when you look at them full screen, they don't look that good. But when you shrink them down to make them small, you can easily see it. It's totally there, totally clear. Scott Carpenter did a, um, oh, he redid that picture of that face where he kind of double, doubled it side to side. Hard to explain it, but um, he did some work on it. But anyway, so I had success with that. But what I'll tell you is strange with it is this a um, couple instances. Uh, number one, I uh, researched this area, well, like I was saying, Dow Mountain, and I had to move cameras there. Oh, not to mention, I think I did have a few other pictures of Bigfoot body parts, like legs or big figures from behind brush and whatnot, and, and possibly another one in the open on all fours that was in black and white mode on the camera, but they weren't d definitive at all. And I didn't even really show them to people just because, you know, you can show pe people all these, you know, crappy pictures of Bigfoot all day long, and they don't really prove anything. So, you know, um, anyway, so Down Mountain, I had a really weird experience there with the camera. Uh, a lot of weird experiences at Down Mountain, in fact, and I've talked about it quite a bit. There's a couple of YouTube videos where I take some a guy to Down Mountain, and, in fact, this little waterfall area, his name is uh, Matthew D. Hines. He ran for uh, state representative in Washington State, I think District 1. Or, uh, no, it was U.S. Congress. He didn't win. But anyways, <clears throat> he's written a bunch of books and stuff, and he did a podcast related to Bigfoot. He went up to the site with me. But anyhow, I did trading with them there, all kinds of other stuff. Uh, they threw rocks at me. They didn't give anything to me back in return, but I, I left items for them there, and they took them from me, and sometimes they'd bring them back. But anyways, what I did there is because I had such a thing going on for such a long period of time where they were kind of interacting with me there, but I wasn't having any success with gathering any type of real evidence, uh, I decided that um, I was going to try something different. So I made a box, a wooden box that I could hang out on a tree that had a, hit, a hinged lid on the face of it. And in this box, I fastened uh, one of my Reconyx cameras. And then I had this gross-looking mannequin head that was foam, and I carved out the back of it, and I shoved it over the top of the camera. So in order to activate the camera and get a picture taken, you had to pull the head off the camera, right? And then immediately it would get a picture taken. Well, some, some of the evidence at this site or, or some of the things I had done led me to believe that they were interested in human-type object, human objects. Uh, dolls and stuff like that, so I thought the head might intrigue them a little bit. It was kind of creepy looking, though. I mean, it looked like a, a zombie head, sort of, more or less, because it was in bad shape. But nonetheless, <clears throat> I tried it out, and what I did was I placed a camera, you know, well, no, I, did, I had other cameras in the area, too, but I put this box on the street, and it was facing going down this canyon right next to this waterfall. So it was going facing downstream and had like a 50, 60 yard open view in front of it. And it kind of uh, had a, just this perfect shot of this creek going down and, and you could see it kind of a V in front of it as it went through this uh, rock on both sides and then it opened up into the forest where the creek went out. <clears throat> and I went back a few times, you know, wait a week or whatnot and nothing would happen and I started getting frustrated. I think I even put pheromone chips in there, uh, which are like scent chips. Allegedly, I think these were ape and human mixed ones. They were supposed to be for Sasquatch, and uh, it didn't work. So finally, I propped the uh, box open a little bit to see if I could entice them, because I knew they were around there all the time. They were coming in and out of the site regularly. Um, 
but they didn't want anything to do with my box, which kind of surprised me. I thought they'd be opening that thing up right away and looking inside. Um, so I popped it, up, propped it open, nothing happened, and finally I got to the point where I propped the box all the way open with a stick. I pulled the head off to the side, then left it sitting there, and just left the camera open. Well, I came back like two days later, and uh, I was amazed by what I saw. I started coming down the trail through this yard down to this creek, and I noticed that there was looked like a string that was suspended above the water of the creek. And I got down to the creek, and I looked both directions, and it was as far as I could see going down. And it was going upstream towards where my camera was. So it was suspended like three to four feet above the water and be wrapped around a twig every now and then to keep it suspended, and it just followed the creek perfectly. And then I looked up, I got to where the trail went down, and I seen it, and the string went right to the base of the tree where my camera was at, and it ended there. And on top of the end of the string was a rock about the size of a basketball, probably a rock that weighed about 70 or 80 pounds. It was just sitting on top of the spring, the string. Because I know that because when I got up to the camera, I pulled the rock off, and the string was loose. That was the very end of it. And... To let you know, after I checked the camera and everything, I walked down this creek, and it was like 300 yards of string. It was like kite string or something, a whole roll of it. White string, not very big diameter. Like, so somebody stole it from somewhere. So this thing was right at the base of the camera, so there's no way that whatever placed that string there, which did it with such care and took its time doing it, there's no way its pictures wouldn't be on this camera. So I checked the camera when I got home, and sure enough, there's no pictures on it except for me, the ones of me approaching it. <laughs> After when I came there that day to pick it up, there wasn't a single picture on it of anything um, except me. So whatever was able to put that string there and suspend it above the water and take its time and then put it that string tip underneath at the base of that tree and stick a rock on top of it, it was able to do that without getting its cam a picture taken. So it was able to get in front of the camera do all that stuff, and the camera never knew it was there while it was in operation. And the batteries are fine on that one. So I can't explain that. Um, another incident was, um, this was close by to this area. It was Price's Lake. It's in the Hood Canal State Forest. It's uh, in an area that was closed off to the public. I don't know that it still is. It was a well elk uh, refuge area where they wintered over in this spot. You could get in there, but you had to walk and it was behind gates, but I had keys to get in from the DNR because I was doing game camera security for them, and at the same time I was doing Bigfoot research. And this area was adjacent to Hama Hama where I got the pictures up on the hill and Dow Mountain where I just explained this other incident to you guys. So it was a real spooky area, and I had investigated a few sightings in there. One of them happened to be by a, a county employee, and I was a deputy sheriff at the time. I think he worked at Public Works, and he had been archery hunting in there a few years prior had a tag, and um, it had been like September, and he bedded down some elk at the uh, one end of this lake where there's kind of a crossing in this swamp. It used to be a logging camp on this lake um, in the turn of the century up until the 20s, long gone now. And then Boy Scout camp after that, which was long gone, and, and then people fishing and stuff, and it. now it's got wild, pretty nice wild trout in it. Um, but it, it's only a uh, walk-in access. There's no roads that go right to it. So anyways, um, this guy had this sighting down here under these really big old vine maples where he was pushing these elk in here the night before, bedded them down, left, came back at the before daylight, went in there and the elk were gone, and he couldn't figure out why they were gone because he knew them really well where they would go, and they wouldn't leave the spot. But apparently they did, and... So he's in here looking around for these elk that are gone, and he happens to look over in these fine maples, and he says this guy in a rain suit was standing like 150 yards from him just looking at him under these vine maples. And these vine maples come out of these bunches, and then they droop over, you know, on all directions. And he yells at the guy, and the guy doesn't say anything to him. He just turns around and walks away. So he walks over to where the guy was at and looks up, and where right where the guy's top of the guy's head is, was right below these vine maples. Well, it's like over eight and a half feet high. And um, so he was pretty sure he saw a Bigfoot. Uh, anyways, I, that was one of the guys I talked to about that area, and I talked to a few others that had found some structures in there and tracks over the years too, but 
hadn't seen anything else. I did find like a 19-inch print in there over the few years that I had been going in and out of there. And I felt watched quite a few times when I was in there, too. Felt presence quite a few times, but I never heard anything significant or even wood knocks or anything. Just spooky. Um, anyways. I, I, yeah, go ahead. Go, time. Oh, I'm getting to it. I'm getting to it. So I had two cameras set up on this area, close to the area, actually right in the area where this guy had this sighting a few years prior. One of them was right on the other side of this crossing, and one, one of them was... Uh, what would site have been? Would have been the south side of the crossing, closer to where I parked my vehicle. And I had to traverse all the way around this lake to get to this other side. So it was like an hour and a half walk to get to the other camera. Well, first camera I get to, the batteries are dead right away. And uh, it was cold when I went back, middle of winter time, and I was by myself. So I hike all the way around the other side of the lake. And, um,. Well, keep in mind the batteries were dead on this camera, and they were lithiums, brand new. So I didn't know how many pictures were on it. I couldn't read the card or anything at that time until I get it into a device that I could read the card on and know how many pictures were on it. So I hike around the other side of the lake, and I put this camera on a big vine maple tree uh, that was facing this crossing, which a lot of animals use. Well, I get to the camera, and I see that the vine maple tree, which is like a 7 or 8-inch in diameter tree, is just shredded right above the camera, snapped off. And these things are not easy to break. And the camera has been turned 90 degrees all the way around, right? So I'm like, okay, well, that's pretty interesting. And so I check that camera. I get out of there, uh, take the card out of there, take the whole camera because the tree's been snapped off, and uh, go home and check the cameras. Uh, the one that had the dead battery, the first night I set it, there were like two sequences of false triggers where it just took pictures in the dark and there was nothing there. And the batteries went dead immediately after that. And these were brand new lithium batteries. Should have been 13 months of use in them. The other camera, when I check it, I see that about 25 minutes after I set the camera, the camera gets the camera gets turned 90 degrees, and the tree gets snapped off. So no whatever, uh, yeah, whatever did it, watched me do it. And then a raven would show up every couple of weeks and just put its eyeball in the camera and look at it looked like the same bird. I don't know. But it was awful strange. So, you know, that was a bit spooky because I realized that whatever moved my camera knew, had watched me go in there and set it. And it didn't want that camera at that crossing because that's where it crossed. So it didn't like it. I think that's the last time that I put cameras in there. probably didn't put them in there again after that, I don't think. I was kind of spooked. Um, that was later on in the evolution of things, too, and I was kind of getting pulling back. But that's uh, pretty much my two weirdest experiences I had with cameras. That is so weird, man. Nate, when you hear Rich talk about that and these cameras being manipulated by some unknown force, what is your thoughts when you hear that story or those stories, pardon me? You know, because this is areas, yes, hunters can get in there, okay, but... It's so remote that it's not an area which it sounds like, much like my area up here. It doesn't sound like this is an area that is very well traveled by people or outdoors people. Exactly. No, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, if it was a human, you know, it would, it would the camera would have picked it up, or an, like like it does an animal. So I don't know. I it's. Man, I don't have any answers on that. I like I said, we had our one experience in uh, our hunting camp encounter. The one time we put cameras up and they were around, we had those same issues, type of issues. You know, we had trees pushed over. Uh, the one camera should have caught the tree. There was a big tree that was pushed over right in front of the camera, and it didn't. It malfunctioned. So, I mean, I don't know. I wish I had answers, but I don't know how they, you know, it goes to that special abilities thing that we talked about. Um, they just, there's something about them that's not normal. It's um, like our, they seem to have, go ahead. Uh, I, I hate, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Continue. Oh, it's okay, Rich. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, Dave. Uh, I wish I had better answers for that. I, I don't know how they do it. Uh, you know, I just, I, I don't know. I don't know either. I mean, do you think, Nate, that maybe they smell the technology, maybe the, the grease that 
that keeps the cameras going or the they maybe pick up on the sounds of the electronics buzzing, which are very quiet. I mean, this is something that is that is strange on how these creatures are able to manipulate these cameras. They always seem to know where they are. Well, I think there's Go more ahead, to Mitch. it than I, I think it's. Uh... I think there's more to it because <clears throat> you have to look at all the aspects of the uh, anomalies with the electronics and the cameras in particular, and you have to look at the big picture. I think and kind of put all the pieces together because we don't we don't really have any answers. All we have is the evidence, you know, at this point, and it leads to some place. But you know, we have these anomalies with batteries going dead, you know, for no reason. Brand new batteries in certain areas. Uh, the pictures that you do get of Sasquatch tend to be. The focus isn't correct on them, and these cameras are like pre-focused. You don't see this anomaly that much with other animals, but <clears throat> whenever you have a Sasquatch get into view, or you get these uh, possible or lead Sasquatch picture, pictures, many many times they have a blurriness to them, or, or a slight. They're out of focus. You just can't. They don't. They're not that clear, you know. And, and many of the times, it doesn't make sense why that's the case. You know, it. Uh, and then the fact, you know, you put I put these cameras in many places where there's no way these things would have been able to know what they are. You know, I, I don't know, maybe they could smell them, but, you know, other animals don't seem to be deterred by them so much. I think it's more of a non-organic reason, I, uh, maybe quantum physics or science or some ability they have to sense the electromagnet, electromagnetic field on the camera or something in that order of it because whatever it is it seems to be an otherworldly type ability that gives them the ability to not be have their picture taken if they don't want to you know uh, because it seems to me the instances where i've had them give me a picture is like up in the hammer hammer it's almost like they wanted to because they just will you know grab the camera and stepped in front of it versus i've hidden them all day like in medievally hidden them i mean i've 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 get put in massive effort to hide these things to where I can't even hardly see them anymore, you know, from five feet away, and uh, it just still doesn't work. You know, it's like um, Harstein Island was a good example. I had an encounter there and had cameras all, you know, in a small area, like five of them. These I had a sighting where these things were kind of between some of my cameras, even where I was checking one, and I didn't have pictures of them on the camera. I had I had a track found right next to a camera, but I didn't get a picture of it on the camera. So, I mean, I really don't know, but I think that the answer is not uh, an organic answer. It's not at least an answer right. that we can reason in our own and figure out based on the knowledge that we have. I think the answer lies somewhere, probably in quantum physics, to be honest with you. Could very well be. Gentlemen, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are through one hour. We're going to head into hour number two. Nathan Rudd, Rich Germo. we're talking Sasquatch tonight. On Spaced Out Radio, hope you're enjoying this as much as I am right now. We'll be back with more in Hour 2 next. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. This is Amber Beckrud, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. 
We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines report. We are independent, and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines report. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best-rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother Is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother Is Watching. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do? What to do? Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauce has come in three flavors. The burning Bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. 
We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free. All you got to do is go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. The only thing I ask for in return is hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight. In the SOR Space Travelers Club. Oh, goodness. What did the clam choose for us tonight? Let's find out. Hiberniculum. Hiberniculum is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we are talking Sasquatch all night from Washington State. We have Nathan Rudd and we have Rich Germo. We are talking serious, serious stuff about this creature that seems to live in the forest, but damn it, we can't find a body anywhere. We can't prove the full existence, even though many of us have had sightings. We've seen the evidence with footprints, handprints, and we go from there. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having us. Yep. No, no problem. No problem at all. Nate, I'm going to start with you on this one because, you know, there's a lot of debate in the Bigfoot field on whether or not this is an actual creature that we are dealing with or if it's something supernatural. I know this is a topic that everybody rolls their eyes on. Everybody gets sick of this question, okay? But we have to investigate it. You know, where do you stand on this? Well, <clears throat> I think it's uh, flesh and blood, but I, I don't know. It's it's tough. I'm I'm kind of torn. It's uh, when you look at their their abilities and their ability to evade and and disappear and not be seen and and uh, you know, like our encounter we had in hunting camp, they were all around our tent. I don't know how many it was, but I mean, we, we rushed out of the tent multiple times, never saw them, never heard them run away. Although at the same time, we'd hear super loud knocks behind the tent. We heard growls. So I don't know. We're dealing with something different here. Something, uh, I, I, I keep wanting to say paranormal. I think there's some kind of paranormal angle to this whole thing. Um, you know, Rich is a guy that could speak a lot to the DNA study, but when you look at that, study and uh you dig into that um there's there's more to this and like you said people roll their eyes but uh i don't know i think you have to be open-minded um you know you look at that dna and you you think about the accounts of the giants you know in the bible and um the giant bones found you know in the 1800s and the turn of the century and the giant mounds and there's just so much to this that is unknown and you just start to try to put the pieces of the puzzle together and you know i you start to get some ideas but we just don't know and it's just a hard it's a hard thing to pin down but i i would say that there is a a supernatural or paranormal side to these things and maybe there's maybe we're dealing with multiple beings maybe there's a, a flesh and blood sasquatch and there's something else um, I can't quite put my finger on it. You know, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm learning from people like Rich and I, gosh, I, I try to listen to guys that have been doing it for years and, you know, Scott Carpenter and, uh, guys like that. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a real mysterious topic. Like I said, hard to put your finger on it and everyone's got different opinions and, you know, there's a little bit of fighting that goes on in the Bigfoot world, but. I just think you have to be open-minded and you kind of just kind of do your own research. Once you dig into it, things start to, 
you start to see things, you know, that, that you never even thought possible. So that's kind of where mm-hmm. I'm at on it. Rich, yeah, how about you? That makes where sense. do you stand on it? Uh, more or less same, based on what my experience is and what I know with the DNA. I, I think that they are flesh and blood, but with like quantum ability, abilities that are really only able to be defined by quantum physics, I guess you would say. Stuff that you can't touch and see and you can't really explain it with classical science, but it's real and it exists because you can see it and experience it, you know, and even more than that. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it can uh, it can touch you in all kinds of different ways. Um, but, uh, yeah, these are, it's, a weird t- it's a weird thing, you know. That, I mean, I went into this thing, you know, looking at it from an uh, investigator detective point of view. You know, I came into this Bigfoot thing not being a skeptic because I had seen one already before I believed in him. I was, uh, I had to see it to believe it, and then uh, I went for a period of years where I wasn't involved in any research whatsoever. It just kind of changed my behavior because I was aware, and then I had an opportunity to get involved, or I was kind of pushed into it by Derek Randalls, and we, you know, started this thing, and I thought, you know, I could be the one. You know, I, I wanted to be famous, and I thought I could make money off of it, and I thought, well, why not me? You know, I've got all this training you know, an experience. I was a good cop. I was a detective at that time when I got involved in research. I had already seen one, so I knew they were real. And I thought, well, shoot, if I put a, put the effort into this and I put into everything else, there's no way that I, that I'm not going to be successful. You know, why couldn't it be me to be the one to to blow this whole thing wide open? And you know, and I I thought going into it that these things were likely an ape or a uh, a rare relic hominid of some kind. Uh, but you know, just the organic evidence, the uh, the the density of sighting reports, and the fact that it happened over a long, long period. These sightings reoccur over a long period of time in the same areas, and then you're having sightings fairly close by each other, but also spread out throughout the whole county. And for instance, Mason County, where I was researching, there were sightings all over the place. And you know, I started going into areas where there were historical sightings, and I would find evidence of them after a short period of time, even if there weren't recent sightings even in the last 10 or 15 years, I would still find stuff. And uh, it started to tell me that there was way more of these things than people thought that there was. They weren't rare at all. But then that even makes it stranger to the fact that there's such a lack of physical evidence and photographic or video evidence is the fact that you're dealing with something that's not that rare. They seem to be all over the place. Um, living close by people a lot of times, too, just beyond the fence lines, not out in the wilderness. They don't have to be far away. They steal people's trash and get into dumpsters and stuff sometimes, too. You know, it, uh, But they seem to be able to evade detection, you know, even though they're fairly common. And um, technology doesn't really seem to be much of a big deal to them. They can overcome that pretty easy if they want to, too. It doesn't even seem to deter them all that much. So... You know, after over a long period of time, I evolved to this looking at it and, and through my own experience and uh, just using common sense and looking at the big picture, I started to have to come to a conclusion that we're dealing with something here that is not just flesh and blood, I mean, uh, in the sense that we think it is. You know, this thing has other abilities beyond the, what we are able to do, or at least what we know how to do, and these things can... They can find you remotely if they want to. They can find you in your dreams. You know, they can wake you up. They can talk to you through their minds. I mean, they can do all kinds of crazy stuff. I've, I have no doubt whatsoever. You know, these things can cloak possibly. I mean, I may have had an experience with that myself, uh, and I certainly have talked to people that claim to have seen them cloak before. And so, yeah, that's my experience and why that I came from looking at one way in the very beginning and evolving to looking at it the way that I do now based on my experience and the evidence that I witnessed. And, uh, you know, a lot of the evidence seems to be this strange stuff. And a lot of these researchers used to not consider it all that much, and I think more of them now are considering it than they used to. Uh, But it's at least half the evidence seems to be this weird paranormal type stuff that's reoccurring with these witnesses and I even experienced some of this stuff on my own that uh, fell right into that category so 
Yeah, I mean, we're not dealing with just a regular thing out there. This is something that uh, seems to be a ghost and a, a flesh and blood animal all tied into one. Well, that brings up an interesting point, because you said more, more people are starting to to think that way, Rich. So my question to you is, for those who are still narrow-minded, who refuse to go down that road, I, I find that, you know, and I'm not a scientist, but I talk with a lot of scientists in the in the paranormal field surrounding this show. And the one thing that I have learned, breaking down science to its simplistic form, is is everything's a theory until it's proven or disproven. Yet, mm-hmm. when it comes to Sasquatch, we have so many people out there who are absolutely refusing to go down that road that there could be something special about this creature. And to me, that doesn't do the research any favors whatsoever because you can't eliminate something just because you don't personally believe in it. And you could be missing out on one of the greatest stories here and the greatest findings here if you just open mm-hmm. up your mind. So with that yeah. being said, how do you how do if someone is an amateur looking into this, because the majority of our audience, they're not going out there into the forest. They're not going researching. They're not driving the gravel roads. They're not walking the deer trails. They're listening to people like you, like Nate, like Dr. Jeff Meldrum and David Politis mm-hmm. and Steve Istall and all of these other people for that information. How do they take the proper information and decipher what is going on. Well, here's the thing, you know, this is Sasquatch is a strange situation. You know, what I found out through the research that I had in this topic was that it's a personal journey. What you learn is really what you end up learning about yourself through this thing and how you relate to it. And to the people that don't see that, well, then they're ignoring evidence on purpose because there's no way that you can be involved in the topic and not run across the strange stuff, either through witnesses or through your own experience. And I don't care who you are. If you've been doing this long enough, you're going to have encountered it. And if you claim that you haven't, then you're not being honest. And that's all I can really say about it. Uh, As far as for the individual wanting to be interested in the topic, I think you need to go into it with a real open mind and uh, look, at at, look at it in a way that you're willing to consider any evidence that comes your way related to it. And you're also not going to discount any experience that you have that doesn't make sense or, or you're not comfortable with uh, because you're not doing a service to yourself or, or any, but anything else related to this topic if you're not fully honest about it or fully ready to accept any possibility that comes your way. I mean, when the evidence presents itself in a specific way, you got to accept it in the way that it, it's there, in the way that it is. You can't change the evidence to fit the box that you want it to go into. No, true enough. But, Nate, I bring you in here. I mean, how many times have, have you heard people talking about, you know, these these long tracks of prints in the mud or in snow, and they just stop. And they have no understanding of how that seemed to work, yet the idea that this creature seems to have just vanished. Okay, yes, it's simple to sit there and say, well, it walked backwards on its uh, on its uh, tracks. Well, you would have a double print, would you not? If it retraced its sap? Yeah, I would say so. That's... That's awful weird. Uh, I don't think it's yeah, like or or you find one print. We I found an incredible print uh, a few years back hunting. It's just one print, real deep in the mud. You could see the toes. I, really, the best print I've ever found myself. But it was just one, and and I looked around, and I couldn't find any more prints. I mean, how do you explain that? And uh, and s- some of the stuff that happens to us. Uh, this last trip out a couple weeks ago. The last night we were there, um, just as another example of kind of the weirdness of of this topic, uh, my son had this dream, said it was super vivid, and he, he kept saying that he kept hearing this voice saying, leave, leave, really loud, leave, and nothing happened that I know of, you know, Sasquatch related that night, but just stuff like that, and then we've been kind of frozen before, and, you know, we, we'd wake, I'd wake up in, a, in my tent and I couldn't move kind of like 
frozen, um, couldn't yell out to my son who was, you know, next to me in the, the next tent down, just weird stuff like that. And I think people maybe brush that stuff off. I think you need to slow down and, and just kind of take that stuff into account. Cause I think it all adds up in the big picture, just the weirdness of it all stuff you hear talking or in the distance, just, you know, it's just really strange. It is totally strange. And, you know, have you ever cr- come across, Rich, those those sets of tracks that just seem to vanish? I have not seen those, <laughs> but uh, I've never had that. I've heard of people uh, uh, running into that before, but, you know, what's really the most logical explanation for that, truthfully? I mean, if you see them just end in the snow or in the mud and there's no explanation for it it's not possible for something to walk, walk backwards in its own tracks and not leave some sort of evidence of that uh the most logical explanation is that it disappeared that it teleported or it went to another dimension or who knows but it's not there anymore and it ended w- right in one spot so it's not that difficult for me to think of that possibility after what i've been through you know researching this topic either because I know I have had researchers on this show who are staunch, uh, absolute uh, uh, refuse to even open their minds up to the fact that there might be something supernatural with this. Is there a different way in investigating, Rich, the the ability of keeping your mind open, whether or not it is has the ability to cloak itself or is supernatural or telepathic or whatever comparatively to the creature whom we believe is of natural uh descent and evolution on this planet um hang on can you repeat that one more time please i'm sorry well well, just in in regards to the whole idea of of the creature is there a different way to investigate this creature from a supernatural side comparatively to those who refuse the supernatural side, don't believe in it, don't want anything to do with it, and are looking for a physical creature that's evolved over time? Hmm. You know, that's an interesting question. You know, I haven't found one, to be honest with you. I, I uh, haven't found any successful avenue. It's so hard. You know, it's so hard to say that because you have a whole group of people that, are engaged in this that are already looking at it from a paranormal point of view and people that claim to be able to mind speak with them. And I haven't experienced it, but I don't doubt it whatsoever. And they seem to know or, you know, quite a bit related to that. And then you have the people that are looking at it and investigating purely from an organic standpoint, collecting physical evidence, and they're having some success as well. Um, so, you know, I don't know. You know, I don't. That's a hard question. I can't really say one way or the other. All I can say is what happened to me in my experience. And uh, I can't really give people advice on one way or the other, which way to go. All I can say is you got to learn from what your own experience is. Right. Same question to you, Nate. Yeah. You know, Rich just said it's hard. It, and this is, it's, it's hard to explain. Uh, it, <laughs> I get tired of saying, I don't know, but, there's so much that I don't know, Dave. I'm just being honest. I'd love to sit here and, and just be able to talk to everything, um, have all the answers, but I, I just think there's a, there's a paranormal side to it. So it's just, uh, it's hard to figure out. I I think that, uh, in a lot of cases, maybe they know we, we, we kind of think that maybe they know we're coming sometimes or, um, cause we, we have a lot of, you know, a lot of people may, find this hard to believe but we usually have experiences i i always throw the number of like 75 percent by the time we go out something happens and this the spot we went to a couple weeks ago we go there once a year every year we get vocalizations every year we find uh not necessarily structures but like uh you know bushes woven together we this last time we found this stick symbol just odd stuff and and when you realize how remote that we go people maybe have a hard time understanding this but we're miles and miles in from the last spot that you can even drive a vehicle to so i mean this 
couple of the places uh, humans would rarely go. And you find this stuff, and and, and like the experience that we had with the, the stick symbol, and then I see Rich's video, and it matches up perfect. And we find these within a week or two of each other. And we've just been talking about it. I mean, stuff like that, it just makes you scratch your head. Yeah, and it's, weird. it's just weird, and, and it, it's so, it just, I don't know, Dave, it's hard to explain. There's more to this than we know. Does that make Very sense? I, I mean, I, I, I think that's an honest and valid answer. I mean, sometimes I don't know is the best answer that we can have in this field. And this is one of them. It's just it's one of those frustrating uh, questions that we do get. I want to get to the sticks and and the symbols that they are leaving that you guys have found. We're going to do that in the next half hours. We only got about two, two and a half minutes here on this part of the segment. I want to get to Joe's question here, though, and because I think it's a good one. Because California, Oregon, Washington State, there's a lot of fires going on here. Are yeah, Nate? We'll start with you on this one. Are either of you surprised that we haven't had more encounters with Sasquatch trying to get away from the fires as people evacuate? Yeah, I suppose. Um... It's a tough one too. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know how they, uh, if they know which direction to go or or what. That that's a good question. I'm I'm not sure on that one. What's your What's your thoughts, Rich? Uh, I'm sure they get. I'm sure there's been instances where they've been caught in it. I don't I don't know. I mean, I've heard uh, some stories. I heard a New Mexico report, a big one, that where one was uh, helped by a bunch of firefighters that their degree burns on it and I'm sure it happened. I, did. I mean throughout St. Helens there's a lot of stories about them hauling bodies out from the blast there that were uh burnt in the uh volcano and stuff. There's I've heard uh anonymous uh helicopter pilots that were retired that on the radio or, or on different podcasts over the years that have claimed to um had flown them out, or or soldiers who had claimed to look under tarps and seen them under there. And so, I mean, I'm I'm sure it's happened. You know, I'm sure they've been burnt up before. I mean, they, you know, I'm sure that they are suffering from forest fires just like everything else does. A lot of times, what happens in nature is we only got about thirty seconds left. The animals know it's coming. They can smell mm-hmm. it. They can feel the heat. Animals are very, very staunch on their own survival and i think at times as humans that we forget how smart animals really are when it comes to their own survival whether that's being chased by a pack of wolves a grizzly bear a cougar or a forest fire you know they know how to retreat to safety i mean so a lot of these creatures i think we may forget probably disappeared a couple weeks before the fires even hit their area at least we can hope Nathan Rudd, Rich Germo, Sasquatch Talk on Spaced Out Radio tonight continues right after this. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just 5 bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great form for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. 
Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. Hello, space Travelers, it's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month and follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. We're taking Sunday nights out of this world on Spaced Out Radio. This is Michael W. Hall, also known as the Paranormal Lawyer. Together, we're going to go on an exciting journey into the unknown. I'm going to bring you some of the best interviews in the paranormal and supernatural to start your new week off on a freaky note. So tune in to Spaced Out Sundays with me, Michael W. Hall, only on SpacedOutRadio.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Welcome back as we pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. We really do appreciate it. We want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, 
Check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight we are talking Bigfoot, Sasquatch. Is it real? Is it Memorex? Is there something in the forests around North America? Joining us from Washington State tonight are Rich Germo and Nathan Rudd, who spent a lot of time out in the forest looking for this creature. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Nice good, to be here. Good to be here, Dave. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Let's get to Ron's <laughs> question right off the bat. How come we don't see evidence of a lot of baby Sasquatch? I think we do Boy. just as much. Yeah, people find little prints. I I have seen them and pictures yep. and stuff. I haven't pers I haven't personally found any, but yeah, and people have sightings of them too. You know, they'll see they'll see a a younger one, a shorter one. You you see that in a lot of encounters. You know, if you if you uh, if you listen to the encounters, you you'll they're out there. People see little ones too. Well, okay, I'll say something as well, and that is. Uh... You know, if the parents are responsible at all, and these things like to uh, live in a way to be undetected, they probably keep a pretty tight leash on their little, you know, toddler and little baby Sasquatches and don't let them just run around and do whatever they want because uh, they couldn't stay hidden very easily if that was the case. All right. You, you know, that brings to a good point. Now, a couple of years ago, I was telling Nate about uh, this story previous, and a lot of my audience members already know, where a couple buddies of mine and I, we actually heard talking in the forest, and we actually got scared out of the, out of the area because we know there were two of them at minimum. Now, there's a lot of people out there who have talked about these sentries Rich, where it's almost like they triangulate you in the areas where they want you to go, maybe to get out of Dodge or just to get you back on a trail that's going to take you out of their area. Have you ever had this experience or seen it happen? I have not been escorted out or seen it happen, but I've heard people tell me about it plenty of times. But yeah, I have never had it happen. What do you think about that, though? Do you, do you think that's uh, real? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I've uh, I've investigated reports where that's exactly what they've said, where they've been pushed out of an area and escorted out like they weren't welcome there at all. I've actually heard about that a more, quite a few times, you know, out of the Hood Canal area and some of the drainages, and uh, there's some pretty uh, good BFR reports that explain just that. <clears throat> what you described, sure, I mean, uh, what do I think about it? I think that some of these times they want to, get people away from their family group or, or an area that they're in. And I mean, kind of what happened to me at Harstein Island was somewhat like that, but it was in a much smaller area and uh, they didn't really have to escort me out. They just pushed me out right away when they were there that day. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I, they do it for sure. And it's gotta be to protect a family group or an area or something. Dave, that's possibly what happened to us uh, in our hunting camp, uh, you know, because we, we, we go hunting there every year, probably the last, I don't know, six, seven years. And, uh, you know, a couple days in, they started harassing us and, you know, it, it worked eventually. We, we ended up leaving that last night. We uh, kind of gave up because we had no sleep and we were stressed out. And so who knows, maybe they were just in that area at that time and when we got there just by chance. And, uh, they didn't want us there though. That was real obvious. And, uh, you know, we tried to tough it out as long as we could after two nights of no sleep and stuff like that. You, we kind of just gave up, um, but it worked. So, you know, they definitely pushed us out of there. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're in remote areas too. I think that they're more yeah. likely to push people out in remote areas than they are in, in not remote areas. <clears throat> it, that that's the experience that I've seen where people that are going into wilderness, that's they're either camping or they're on their way in or, and that's when they get pushed out or escorted out is, uh, before they even get there a lot of times, or they've been at the camp and then they, it just so much stuff happens 
they just don't feel welcome anymore and they just want out of there eventually. You know, that yeah. seems to be a I was going to say too, Dave, I'm sorry. I was going to say too, like I, I think sometimes when you stay in an area for an extended amount of time, like, you know, a lot of times we'll go out for a two or three day weekend and we might have something happen. But uh, when you're, when you're in an area for say a week or longer, I think depending on the circumstance, sometimes, you know, they'll, uh, they'll get cranky that you're there and you're not leaving. You're there for a while. And maybe that's what happens too. They just get sick of you being there and they'll yeah. uh, might eventually push you out. And I think that's kind of what happened to us. We, they just happened to be there and, and they didn't want us there that week. So I, I think it was maybe just, just a chance thing on that one, but maybe yeah, that's what happened. You know, I always, who knows? Yeah, maybe so. I, I used to think, you know, my, my push sighting was chance, but then later I, I kind of feel like that. I don't know that chance even exists with Bigfoot at all, to be honest with you, but it's right. possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I go back and forth on that for sure. Um, just it's hard to figure out sometimes mm-hmm. it, it, it really is isn't it? it and you know i mean this also leads to uh, a question that came up earlier in our chat rooms and and you know the first time i had heard about these sentries was when i was watching a documentary that was created by the the very controversial todd standing where there's a lot of people who believe his work. There's a lot of people who believe that he has faked evidence over the years. You know, the documentary that I saw included Dr. Jeff Meldrum and the late Dr. John Bindernagel, who um, I will say in the documentary seemed a little forced to use the answers that, that Mr. Standing had wanted them to say. And it was cleverly edited. But that's just my point of view. Yet we struggle to get these very, very clear photos of what they actually look like up close and personal. Yet Mr. Standing claims that the photos that he has released are absolutely real, number one, and number two are of clarity. It's like they almost look like masks. You know, Rich, you yeah. got more experience in this. I want to start with you on this one. Uh, you know, I've seen his pictures. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm suspicious of him a little bit. But, you know, uh, this guy, Randy Breeson, who's from British Columbia, uh, Vancouver Island, maybe. I'm not sure. I think he's Vancouver Island. He's got pictures I believe to be legitimate of one of a face, and it's kind of similar to the ones. Standing has, but you know, Standing has video of one that looks vastly different than those uh, Eskimo face looking ones that he has. That you know, the one that has a black face and the eyes that's kind of hidden underneath of a in a root wad or something. Do you, are you familiar with that one? Yes, that was part of his documentary. Now that one looks really real to me, um, but you know, the way things are with costume and everything else, I mean, they can do pretty good stuff. I mean, it's hard. Any, you know, here's the deal with video evidence, and no one's going to, you're not going to be able to prove anything with video evidence these days at all or photographs because you can fake anything. So, and nobody's going to believe it even if it's real. I mean, some people might, but not everybody's going to. It's not going to be that it's definitive no matter how good it is, it seems like, because anything can be faked. I mean, uh, you can throw anything out there and, some people are going to say it's a hoax no matter what, <laughs> you know. So it just seems to be that way. So, I mean, I can't make a judgment on this stuff, you know. Yeah, there's suspicious, uh, suspicious aspects to some of his things. But, you know, he's had uh, been able to get Bender Nagel and, and uh, Meldrum to go up there, and Les Stroud spent a lot of time up there. And, you know, these people wouldn't be going up there if there wasn't a reason why. And, you know, they seem to have hitched their wagon to him to one degree or another, and they're not saying he's a hoaxer. So, you know, there's got to be some validity to it. I'm not a, I'm not going to come out and condemn him or, or say his stuff is fake or anything like that because, you know, I can't really say. What's your thoughts, Nate? Yeah, I would agree with Rich on that. Um, that one uh, 
where where it's uh, looking under the log. Um, that one looked real to me. The other two, I just my gut. I always say go with your gut. Mm-hmm. And I just I'm not sure about those two. The like the high def ones where they're looking through the trees, especially the one that's uh, kind of a tan color. It just looks really weird. But who knows? Who knows? Yeah, These look- things are. Yeah. yeah. I know they, they can look, look different and uh Yeah. Go ahead, Rich. Oh, I think they look like Muppets kinda. You know, I don't know. Yeah, but, yeah. But who knows? You know, I don't know. I the, mean the, uh like you said, it's it's so easy to fake things these days, um, with the technology and the all that that it's I, just hard to say. But the two sightings I've had I wasn't close enough to see real facial detail and the Harsty Island one was moving fast. So, I mean, it was kind of a blur, even though it was close. I mean, if it was standing still, I could have seen it, seen it, but it never really stood all the way still when I was locked onto it. So, But the first one, I wasn't close enough at all to see facial um, detail at all, and it was profile to me anyways. It wasn't face on. But, uh, yeah, so I can't say. I don't have um, direct experience with seeing a face of one, so, and the pictures I have are blurry. So that's all I can say about that. Yeah, it's. Well, how do you think this creature stays blurry? I mean, we aren't that bad of photographers. We're not that bad of videographers. Everybody is pretty much, thank you to social media, become a pretty good judge of how to how to uh, take a photo or film a video. I mean. They're never blurry, or they're rarely blurry, I should say. Yet when it comes to this creature, or even Dogman, we're always seeing the blob squatch. We're always seeing blurry videos of something that is, you know, running or walking through a marsh or a treed area. You know, it's frustrating, and I can see where the public gets frustrated by this. So I'm just curious, Mm -hmm. in your opinion... How are we, when it comes to Sasquatch, that bad at photography or videography? Uh, I don't think we are. You know, I think it uh something to do with the Sasquatch and its desire because when you look at the whole, look at it, you know, we haven't been able to outdo what Roger and uh, Bob did in 1967. They were able with, uh, with uh, what, what type of camera was that? Was like an 8, type 8? Or... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they were able to get the best footage that ever exists, and it was almost like uh, that Bigfoot was waiting for him, <laughs> you know, to just walk across that opening for him. And I don't doubt the validity of that at all. I mean, I I know Bob; I've met him many times. Went on some long trips with him in the car and talked to him a bunch, and he's the most honest guy you'd ever meet. So, yeah, you know, I have no doubt whatsoever in the validity of that. And how come, you know, with the technology we have now, and not to mention there's, you know, thousands of Bigfoot researchers that have used game cameras out in the woods. And imagine all the hunters that have just gotten game cameras out there looking for game or all the uh, wildlife research projects that are out there for that are either university-funded, government-funded, federal, state, that are out there utilizing game cameras to, to locate and, and document rare animals. And, at least what, from what uh, they're not showing us if they find them, but I don't think they're getting them either. They're not getting Bigfoot pictures on their game cameras either that much. So it's a strange thing because uh, with the technology out there today and the fact that everybody's got a uh, HD camera in their pocket that has a cell, that has a smartphone, it doesn't seem very likely that uh, an animal or, or humanoid or a hominid or an ape could be out there in the woods in North America roaming around and, we can't manage to get it on camera, even though we see it all the time. <laughs> you know, it. Uh, and I'll say we see it all the time because we do see them fr- fairly frequently. You know, so I can't really explain it other than the fact that it lends back to the idea that we're dealing with something here that seems to have extrasensory abilities or things that we can't uh, describe very well with classical science. Things that they're able to do, and this seems to be one of their uh, talents you know, to make sure that we get blurry photos at best. So, you know, I think that uh, you have to lend it to its uh, um, paranormal or its quantum abilities is what I would say. Do you think it has the ability to use some sort of EMF frequency 
to deflect the images of camera footage to blur itself? Sure, like, could be infrasound, you know, same way that they zap, they zap people or, or uh, if, if that's what they're doing. Or it could be electromagnetic or it could be low-frequency vibrational. Uh, I mean, uh, that makes a perfect sense, you know, that it, that's what it would be because I'm sure that if you knew how to manipulate and use low-frequency vibration that you could find ways to, to, to draw down batteries or or make a, uh electronic device malfunction and not work properly or to make photographs not exposed properly even if they're digital, you know. Or you could even imprint other images, you know, through a... Uh, some sort of unknown means onto these cameras from a remote location. And I wouldn't doubt that would right. be possible even for them to do. So I think anything is possible with these things as far as we can think of. And um, I think to think otherwise is fairly naive, especially if you've had experience with them. All right. Question coming from Sparkles here in the Spaced Out Radio SOR Space Travelers Club on our Facebook and, of course, uh, my computer is being a little silly right now for it, but I will get to it right now. Do you believe these creatures may live underground? I would say that's very possible, Dave. Yeah, yeah, I was I was going to say uh, that's something that we, we kind of think they might have some caves hidden away. You know how vast the forests are, and, like, if you fly over a plane... <laughs> In the Pacific North, fly in a plane over the Pacific Northwest, and you look out out the window. I mean, you know, there's probably caves out there all over the place that we don't we don't even know of. There's places we can't get to, and uh, it makes sense that they would they very well could live in caves or retreat to caves or hide in caves. Yeah, I, I think subterranean is. Uh, I think they might. I think it's possible. We don't have a lot of caves in my area. I mean, they do exist some, but uh, they're not that frequent. I mean, we have a lot of big boulder gardens where there's areas where there's huge granite boulders all over an area, and you'll have little pockets and holes underneath those boulders where there's small caves, and that's potential. I know that uh, sightings and disappearances are uh, associated a lot of times with boulder gardens for some reason. or a lot of Yeah, we've uh, got a lot of those. We got a lot of those up here too, boulder fields and stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's very possible. Uh, and if you look at that map of the cave system of the United States, it's pretty vast. Um, yeah, so that's a good possibility. All right, gentlemen, let's move on. It took a little time to get here, but you guys were talking about these stick symbols, these twigs that have been formed into symbols. Nate, tell us what this is about. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not sure what it's about, and I don't know what it means. And, uh, you know, I've found a lot of, or we've found a lot of structures. That's kind of been our, not our, not necessarily our focus, but where this has kind of led us in the last couple of years. We, before, you know, we'd notice uh, uh, you, you're kind of, your structures where you had the bigger trees stuck in, woven in between each other, just kind of in maybe an X or, or something like that. But these last couple of years, we've found some real intricate things that are really woven together that if you look at it, you got to say that it, it took intelligence to do it, some know-how. And these, these are found in really remote spots, like I said earlier, where humans rarely go or maybe don't even go. We hike, you know, I, I, I can say that we work pretty hard. We do a lot of hiking. We hike up and down mountains and um, we go to spots like that where, you know, you find something like that and you just scratch your head. It's like a, a person wouldn't hike that far up and down the mountains to make a structure like that or this stick symbol we found. Um, we're miles and miles in and and uh, the one we found this last a couple of weeks ago, it was, uh, there's pictures of it on our page. You can go look at it. it it's kind of like an asterisk with a, a diamond in the middle, just kind of a design. We'd never seen it before. I've never even seen a picture of it or anything. Uh, we were shocked to find it. It was on a remote mountainside, miles in. And we'd actually uh, gone off trail, and we hiked up this mountain. Uh, I don't know why. We just said, hey, let's hike up here and see what, what we can find. Well, we found this thing on our way back down. Uh, Chris, my brother-in-law, spotted it. Thank goodness. We, you know, we almost walked right by it. But uh, 
instantly I knew it was something special. And you can, like I said, you can look at those pictures. And then I was, I'd been talking to Rich for a couple of weeks and he told me that he was just uh, with Tobe Johnson and they'd made a video and I hadn't seen it. So I went and looked back and found the video, was watching the video and they found a, some kind of a little structure that was made out of a, a bush and it had this same symbol in the middle of it. And Rich could probably talk about his, what he found in more detail. But the minute my eyes caught that, that design in this bush, I mean, it was the exact same design that we found probably what, two weeks later, Rich. And I just, uh, I don't know it blew me away. Uh, maybe a week, a week from each other. Cause I'd been yeah, back Dave. a week, I think. So yeah. you, know, when you look at the pictures and, and your audience, Dave can go look at those pictures on our, our WIBS page. Um, you'll see, I mean, you see it instantly and I saw it instantly in the video and I started taking screenshots of this uh, design that was in this structure that Rich found. And then I put them side by side and it's, it's, it blows you away. How do you explain it? I don't know. I don't yeah. know either. It's, uh, you know, his structure was found in the Idaho panhandle next to the Northern border. And the one I found was uh, at the uh, northeastern corner of the Olympic Peninsula, right behind my house. And um, it was kind of old, the structure, when we found it. It had been there for a while. <clears throat> but we found some other stuff in the area. We followed in a, uh, it was on a, behind a lake um, where there was a, uh, a landing and a logging road that went around this lake. And... Um, on this grade, there was a pushed over willow tree. So we cut in right there because it seemed to be a marker, and that led us right to this two elderberries being woven together in the same design that Nate found. And and uh, and then beyond that, a few more yards, we found a bone stuck in the ground, a few in, like four inches, and um, a few possible impressions. But yeah, that was right behind my house, literally. In fact, I had never even looked for stuff in there before. I just took him over there because I wanted to check it out, and we found stuff right away. It's not like I find stuff very often either. It's... So, yeah, you just said that, Rich. I mean, so that was my thought. I, it looked like ours had been there a while, too. It was kind of weathered. The sticks were weathered. I would say that it had been there a while. But I just mentioned earlier that I, I wasn't sure why we went up the hill. We just, for some reason, decided <laughs> to go off trail and climb up this mountain. And you just mentioned that, you know, you didn't really plan on going over there. I don't know. It just mm-hmm. seems odd to me that maybe we were somehow led to that symbol and, and it means something. Um, I don't well, know if that it, makes sense. but Well, I think it's as simple as this, really. It, the fact that me and him are communicating about Bigfoot. We both Puts- go out around the same time to go out and do research to some degree. We both find a structure that matches, but they're hundreds of miles apart you know, and probably done at different times, but maybe they were meant to be found at the same time. And maybe it's as simple as that, just the fact that we recognize that. Yeah. It's, it's a very strange coincidence for it to occur. Uh, gentlemen, and I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. More Bigfoot talk, structures, symbols, and whatever else we could fit in with Nathan Rudd and Rich Germeau on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up. All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hello, 
Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do? What to do? Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best-rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. 
Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at space.radio.com. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. We are underway in the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. We really do appreciate that. We want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. All of our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. I forget how to say this one. Hiberniculum. Hiberniculum is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. On Twitter, follow us at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Tonight, for the final time, we introduce Nathan Rudd, and Rich Germo. They are Sasquatch hunters out of the state of Washington. And we're getting into structures, tree structures, symbols, things that are just out of the ordinary when you are in the forest. Gentlemen, welcome back. Thanks, Dave. Good to be here. All right. We're going to start off with a question from Tina here. And she is asking, do you guys think those stick structures are Bigfoot grave sites or graveyards or possibly an entrance to their realm, per se? No, it could be, but not generally speaking. How yeah, Dave, it's hard to say. I mean, some well, some of them might be markers, um, maybe territorial type things, and I'm I'm not speaking to one specific similar structure. I'm just, we don't really know. And the, you know, I've, I've found big structures. Uh, the one we talked about last time, the kind of half tunnel, I would say that's more of like a blind or something possibly. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't think any of us know what they mean. Um, there's some sort of communication or, or marker possibly. Yeah, that I mean, would be my you, guess. Yeah. Sometimes you find them not in the woods too. I had an experience where I, I had oh, yeah. one happened in a weird, weird way where I had a structure pop up in front of me. So I was a cop when I was driving down the road. Actually, uh, I came across it in the middle of my lane. It was like waiting for me there, coming home to my house. That was the like one I, recently, Rich. You told me about. Is that the one you told me? I told you about it recently, but it happened yeah. uh, probably in 20, after my harvesting incident. I was, oh, on my okay. way home. Gotcha. I was on my way home, and I worked uh, North County that night, and I was coming home on Great View Loop Road, and uh, I came around this corner, and it looked like a tornado had touched down in the road, and there was like an eye in the middle where it was all clear, and then there was like pieces of scotch broom scattered in the road, all pointed out directly in orderly fashion from this open eye that was probably six or seven feet across. In the center of this eye, there was a three stick teepee with a balance stick on top and the strange thing about it is that that's the structure that i would make and leave when i would go places to like try to establish communication or just as a marker and it was left for me in the road and somehow something new i was going to be coming down the road at that time and uh, left it there for me (laughs) so it uh i got out and kicked it over for a long time i didn't want to admit that because whatever did that didn't um live by the same rules of time and space that we do. So I was not real comfortable with it for quite some time, but I finally had to accept it for what it was. But I think they did it, um, and it was in um, relation to the incident, my sighting I had at Harstein Island. But, yeah, it may not be in the woods. Mm -hmm. It may be waiting for you at home or someplace else that might surprise you. 
Good what do you point. think these what do you think these structures are? What are are they are they maybe nighttime shelters? Are they hibernation points? Are they just territory markers? Nate? Yeah, like I said before, I I don't think anybody really knows. We could guess. I think all those are good guesses, Dave. Um you know, I wish I knew. I wish I knew what that stick symbol meant that we found. You know, um, maybe they're meant you, you got to you got to. Yeah, well, you got to realize too. These things probably have a lot of when they're not hunting. They probably have a lot of time on their hands out there. A couple of years ago, we found in that same area I was talking about earlier. We found a small. I don't know if it was alder bush or alder berry bush. Small, you know, narrow uh, limbs. But I just looked down at the ground. We were hiking on a trail up there, and I spotted it. And it was intric- It was like it was almost like you could imagine a small one or a youngster sitting down on the ground and just weaving this thing. It was kind of like a square all woven together. And yeah, who knows? I, maybe they're just bored sometimes and they do that yeah, stuff. I'm, I think so. I'm not sure. But uh, we we find stuff like that, and like I said, we you know the, our first years we we were doing this, we were we weren't finding a lot of stuff like this. But now these last couple of years, we're finding a lot of this stuff. So I don't know if you know it's like we talked about earlier. If, if they know they know of us, or they know we're coming, or they're leading us be, to these things. It may I don't be know. It may be that they were always there, but your eye didn't see it before. You just well, that's true it. too. You're right. Because you do, you do learn to, um, that's what I always tell people. And I think you asked me this on the last show, Dave, like things to look for. Um, you got, you look, you got to look, uh, not, you don't want to look down the tunnel. You want to look around. You, you got to have your eyes open and look for stuff that's out of the ordinary. Cause there's a lot of stuff out there. You, you think oh, yeah. about all the stuff that you've walked by before, you know, you just, mm-hmm. if you're, if you're in a hurry or walking fast, you're going to miss things. So we've learned to really slow down and we'll just, we'll walk somewhere and we'll sit for a while and kind of just look around even with binoculars sometimes and then walk a little further and, and look in an area and, and your eyes will pick up. Once you train your eyes, it's kind of like hunting to spot deer and stuff in a way you, you train your eyes to look for stuff like that out of the ordinary. Oh, sure. I was going to say same. That's exactly true because you know, there's a lot of trackers and hunters that uh, walk by this stuff all the time and they don't see it because they're not, they're not looking for it. It's, it's, it's they're blind to it almost they could be as obvious as it could be and their mind is not working in that way to where they're considering even the possibility that there's some aboriginal or humanoid out there that's doing this kind of stuff and making art or communicating or doing whatever it does they look at it and they just see a pile of sticks and even if it looks like Mm -hmm. you know uh, an intelligent hand might have put it together and and, it, and there's not any real feasible explanation for nature doing it. They don't even really consider that. It's just a pile of sticks. It might look You're cool, right. but it's really just a pile of sticks. Exactly. Well, for a lot of no, for you, a lot of people, it. they may pass these these uh, structures off as the weight of snow over the winter that has bent smaller trees. I mean, is that even possible for some of these? Uh, not. No, Dave, not with the struct or not with the symbols and the little structures that we just talked about. It's not yeah. possible. These things are woven together. They're put together in patterns. Yeah, so that's it is not possible uh, with with those. Together. Now, yeah, they're interwoven and stuff like that. So, I mean, the big the big stuff where you see the trees where it looks like it might have fallen over. I mean, a lot of that could be just normal uh, nature. Um, but Mm -hmm. we're talking about something different here. We're talking about little structures that are woven together and then, and then these stick symbols that make a perfect pattern. I mean, Mm -hmm. you can go look at the pictures. You'll see exactly what we're talking about. It's just, that's not possible. So, Hmm. Incredible. Joe has a, a good point here. What if they're hunting blinds for these creatures? I think there's some of that. I've seen it. I've found them before. That are just that, I believe, because I found deer kills in proximity proximity of these locations too that I found where I found that I suspect where they've killed deer in relation to the hunting blinds. 
Uh, yeah, I would that, say the that's same a, thing. Dave. That's a good point. I, I was going to ask if there was any any bones or or skeletons of of creatures around that would have been predatory kills. I found fresh ones twice. One of them was right next to a uh, a blind. I don't know if that blind was active anymore, but I had found tracks in that spot too, and it was a site that I had. Uh, started researching because two witnesses took me into it and said they found tracks in the shelter in there. And I looked further and I found what looked like a blind where uh, around a bunch of game trails. And then I found a deer kill in there where the, the skin had been pulled off of it like a tube sock, just peeled off of it from the legs and everything. Wow. And the meat was picked off, like ripped off of the bone. All the organs were gone except for the mass of the intestines and stomach, which was thrown to the side. And uh, and keep in mind that this spot is only like 35 yards off a dirt road that people travel all the time, and these things are right next to this road. They built a shelter in blind right next to the road, and these women actually had stopped to go pee here, and they walked off of the road when I first got into this location. It's Little Dewato River uh, is where it was at, and uh, they started having a real uncomfortable feeling, and they started looking down. There were all these huge footprints in the sand all over, and they took pictures of them, and uh, they went a little further, and they seen this igloo-shaped structure that was made out of fur boughs that had an opening on one end, and they just felt like it was. They had a real bad feeling, and they got out of there. And they took me back there like six weeks later, and you could see where the igloo structure had been totally disassembled and stacked up in a pile, and uh, it was gone. Other than the remnants of it were there in a nice, neatly stacked pile, and I didn't find any tracks. But I researched that area for. Oh, about four years, and I found tracks there about every three to four months crossing the road. So they were coming through there regularly on a on a schedule. But, yeah, I got off tangent on that. But, uh, yeah, I do believe they use blinds because I've seen evidence of it. Gentlemen, for the fact that you guys have found these symbols on the ground, you found these tree structures, and the way trees are bent, do you believe that maybe – that the, these are almost like landmarks or some sort of forest mapping, so that way they could find their way back to wherever they live, whether, whether it's in cave structures, in the mountains, or underground. Could that be a possibility as well? Yeah. I think it could be, yeah. Definitely, Dave. Uh, I've, I've thought about that. Or maybe it's a... Uh, it's, uh, uh, communication to another group, possibly. Um, who knows? Yeah, but like uh, a Martin kind of a territorial. Shows. Yeah, to to let to let another group know that they're there, or you know, who knows? Or or to let uh, let another group know that humans are there. Or I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. I've I, I've been thinking about this a lot since I found that stick symbol. So. Uh, I had a, I don't know if you knew who Arla Williams is, she's a, I think a Choctaw medicine woman from Oklahoma, and she came out with me, and no. I took her to a couple locations, I took her to some structures I found up in the Hamhama that were adjacent to the big, big, Bigfoot pictures that I got up there on that game camera with the DNA, and she told me that, uh, the structures generally in her mind a lot of times would mark, like, medicine and different things that they would use, and they would put the structures there just to signify a, a special place. It depends on what the structure was and what it looked like. I mean, because I've seen different looking stuff, you know, a few times. I mean, I don't find these things all the time. It's not that common. But generally when you find one, if you look around, you'll start finding more and right in the same spot. Uh, some of them will be older or newer, and they might be different ones. But that's my general finding is, is that. Very interesting. I also want to talk about the amateurs or the people who are just wanting out of curiosity to go into the forest to see if they see anything, whether it's on a logging road or or maybe some sort of forest trail on a hike. Nate, let's start with you because you're you're newer to this. You know, when you started out looking for Sasquatch, what did you do? What did... What did you bring with you? Did you know what to look for? No, I I really didn't, Dave. I mean, I had uh, I had done my own research before we actually went out. I was kind of into it at the time, 
uh, I was listening to a lot of the podcasts, a lot of the, a lot of the encounters. And I think that's a good place to start for anybody is, um, you know, obviously a lot of people are already, already into this that are listening, but if there was someone that wanted to, uh, wanted to get into it more, you know, start by listening to the encounters. You can learn a lot from the encounters that are out there, the, the different things that happen, the different things people find. And we didn't really know, we didn't know what we were doing. We, we, Hey, we always see them out at night, right? On TV and stuff. So we thought, well, let's go on a night hike and you got to be careful. You know, where we're at, there's grizzly and wolves and cougar. And so, you, you know, you definitely want to uh, be, take precaution and take the right gear and, and definitely be careful when you're out there, but um, you got to go hiking out, kind of get away from things, get out in the woods and hike around and, you know, you might be surprised what you might find. Yeah. I mean, when I got into it initially, I wasn't looking for stick structures or anything like that. It wasn't until I started, you know, talking to witnesses and I started reading past reports and and uh, started uh, being exposed to the idea of these things where I started going into the research areas and started looking around closely and, and then I started to notice stuff. And it took me a while to catch on and, and to find what I was supposed to be seeing, but once you see train your eye to find it you do find it and you can see stuff that is natural and you can see stuff that definitely takes intelligence to make and then you see stuff that falls in the middle somewhere where it could be either way but uh, there's definite you know ones that there's no way that anything without hands couldn't have done it um i mean i've seen plenty of that and um, then i've seen some that if you look at them you say well that could be and there's a chance that there was some natural anomaly that made it occur, too. But um, I've seen plenty that were beyond any reasonable doubt to me that it was them, you know, that did it. And, uh, you know, that's, I don't uh, know That's kind of where I'm at. I don't know why, Dave, for sure. Kind of, I was going to say, that's kind of where I'm at right now. We, we, we never found structures when we first started them. Um, I mean, we started somewhere along the way, we started finding them. And like you said, Rich, you kind of train your eye to look for stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. I mean, it takes time. I think this takes time. You're not just going to go out and have, I mean, I don't know. We had the rock, you know, we had the rock thrown at us the first time we went out that kind of started the whole thing. But what we're talking about here now, the structures and symbols and stuff. uh, Yeah. We never noticed those before at first, the first couple of years. The first simple structure that I started noticing to me, and it's one that I even knew knew of, and I, I had questions in my mind about it because I used to see it all the time, and it's not a structure. It's just a phenomena that occurred in these areas I used to go hunting in or just when I was in the woods. You know, teenager, I noticed it. And I always used to wonder where you see small cedars in particular under the understory. I mean, small trees and, and big timber you know, old growth or even just big trees, and you'll see small cedars that are, you know, you know, two to three to four inches in diameter. They're like a maximum of 30 feet tall, and they get bent over and snapped. And uh, the truth is is that when you have a canopy, you know, that is 180, 200, 250 feet tall, 20-foot, 30-foot trees can't get blown over in the wind. It's impossible. <laughs> you know, there's no wind down mm-hmm. there. And uh, you see it frequently, and you see it on game trails, and you see groups of them bent over and snapped. And uh, I always thought, well, maybe it's black bears that are doing it. You know, but these trees don't have limbs on them or anything to scratch on because they don't really have much limbs on them until you get to the tops. You know, there isn't much on them, so they're not really scratching posts, and they don't have abrasive bark. They have smooth bark on them, too, especially that species. And that it's usually cedars is what I find. Those are the ones that they do it to. But they just seem to be, you know, pushed over to where they're bent until they snap. Something's grabbing them and just keeps getting putting pressure on them until they pop. And uh, there's mm-hmm. no possible way that that can be done. And you see it regularly in places, especially where there's alleged activity. I have some right up behind my house, in fact, up here, and um, there's no explanation of it. Wind can't do it. Snow load really can't do it because... They don't have enough uh, limb mass to carry hold any snow to begin with, and they're too strong for 
for the minimal amount of snow that could go on them to be able to have any impact on them or bend them whatsoever. It has to be something that's grabbing them or pushing them over and snapping them. And that was the first thing I yeah. started to notice was that. And those are simple, you know, and they could be anything. I don't know, markers, territory boundary markers, whatever, but something's doing it. And it isn't humans because I can tell you that the trees that I'm seeing doing it as humans would have, it wouldn't matter who you were if you were – seven feet tall and 450 pound line, lineman, you're not going to snap over one of these things. There's no way you could do it. But something is doing it. We just don't exactly. know what it is. Gentlemen, we only got about two and a half minutes left with you tonight. And this is a show that has flown on by. I want to get Chris's question in here to you. What do you guys think about the Sasquatch sightings occurring around UFOs? Rich, have you ever investigated any of these? Uh, I could tell you that uh, my first sighting in the push, within two weeks there was a major UFO sighting and incident within uh, half a mile from there, right on the jetty of where the Quileute River comes out, where there were about 12 witnesses, tribal members that were sitting down there in a dish-shaped object with lights on it, uh, came down right above James Island and, and just hovered over it for a while, and it had lights circling it. And uh, the next day, the FBI came down there and went to the Coast Guard station and took the radar recordings that were down there and told everybody that they saw an experimental helicopter. But they didn't come down and talk to me about my Bigfoot report that happened two weeks earlier. Really? Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. That is interesting. Mm-hmm. I thought so. so do you th- Nate, do you think there is something mm-hmm. tied in between the two? I don't know, Dave. I, I think anything's possible, like I've said before. Um, we actually saw a UFO. I think I talked about it last time. And we saw one right in the, one of our areas where we investigate. It was at night. Um, I can tell it really quick. We were just sitting around the fire. My son spotted it. It came over one mountain range, and it was really low. We'd been watching planes and satellites you know, for a couple hours. This was late at night right before bed. And this thing was super, it was much, much lower than everything else. Super bright, almost hurt your eyes to look at it, made absolutely no noise. And it went from one horizon, kind of slow over the top of us. And we just watched it the whole way. And it disappeared to the east over the other mountain range. This is up in the Selkirks, close to Canada. And we were in shock. I'd never seen, you know, I seen things way up in the sky but this was different it was low made no noise and we knew right away it was something odd and like i said if it was a helicopter you'd hear it we could hear the planes flying at thirty thousand feet with the blinking lights this was uh this was something different so um that's about my only experience with them but it was right in that territory so who knows interesting well yeah. nate nate i want to say thank you for coming back on spaced out radio tonight and, Rich, what a great, great opportunity to meet you as well and discuss the legend of Sasquatch with you guys in Washington State. A real pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks. It was great being oh. there. Thanks, Dave. Had a great time. And thanks, Rich, for coming on, too. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Coming up next, we have the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Dave. Stay tuned. More Spaced Out Radio coming up. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot Hot Sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble, we're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot Hot Sauce, available now at kajans.com. Hey, Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. 
To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to ChiveCharities.org and become a donor today. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes. It's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members-only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hi there, this is the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. I'd like to invite you to listen in each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. For more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. 
I am your host, Dave Scott, hanging out with you from SOR headquarters. I want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. The only thing I ask for in return is hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Shirky Poo's SOR Newswire. On Twitter, you can follow us at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Speaking of the news. Oh, yeah. Here we go. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire, the back end of every show, where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the downright awesome. Oh, if I was American, I would be all over this. A gambling website is offering 500 bucks to a winning applicant willing to serve as a professional cheeseburger tester. You have no idea how much I want this job. Bonusfinder.com, based in Amsterdam, said it is seeking a cheeseburger taster to find the best burger in the United States by grading burgers on criteria, which includes patty texture, patty seasoning, bun softness, bun taste, complexity of flavors used, relish and or sauce taste, cheese flavor, and creaminess, value for money, and quality of the ingredients. The winner will receive 500 cold ones, as well as funds for travel and to purchase the cheeseburgers. The applicant is instructed to taste and review. The company said the randomly selected winner will be announced on October 9th. The taster's reviews will be published on the Bonus Finder website, the company's can oh hold on here. The company's Canadian site bonusfinder.ca is offering a similar position to find Canada's top cheeseburger. I am in. Woo! I am so doing this. So applying for this cuz I you know, I like a good burger. I do. I love a good burger. Now my criteria may be a little bit different than theirs cuz if I have a burger, okay? I want grease. I want my hands to to have the juice oozing all over it, where I got to have about six napkins just to wipe off my hands from that first bite. Look at this. If, if you're watching on YouTube, you can actually see how my hands are completely formed to burger size. Okay? A burger's got to be thick. It's got to be juicy. It's got to be fantastic. I want one of these burgers. I want to be this burger guy. I'm going to apply for it. Okay? Maybe you should too. All right. You know, in baseball, and I love baseball. Okay? I love baseball. Whether it's minor league baseball or major league baseball, it's all fantastic. But sometimes the injuries are a little weird and a little off. Philadelphia Phillies pitcher Zach Wheeler will not pitch against the Florida Marlins because he injured the nail on his right middle finger while putting on his pants. You can't make this up. Phillies manager Joe Girardi says that Wheeler will not start against the Marlins after injuring his fingernail in an accident while dressing himself. You can't make this up, Girardi said. It's very sore. The manager said Wheeler won't be able to pitch until later the week. At the earliest, he will be replaced by Spencer Howard. Wheeler so far has a 2.47 ERA in his first eight starts of the 2020 shortened season. He signed with the team before the start of the year. Five years, $118 million, and he breaks a nail and cannot pitch a game. Come on, Zach. Put some duct tape on it. Use some rosin. You're making 118 mil over the next five years, dude. Suck it up, get on the mound, throw some fastballs. All right, let's do this thing. Here's a weird one. Officials at the St. Louis Zoo are attempting to solve a motherhood mystery after a 62-year-old ball python 
laid eggs despite not having contact with a male python for more than 15 years. Zoo, the zookeepers said they were shocked when the snake, the oldest of her species to ever reside at the zoo, laid her eggs this summer. Her pathologist said reptiles have been known to reproduce asexually through a process known faculative parthenogenesis, and female snakes have also been known to store sperm from a sexual encounter for delayed fertilization. Without genetic testing, zoo staff won't know if this ball python reproduced sexually or asexually, but they intend to find out. Officials said keepers are caring for the eggs, and samples will be set for genetic testing to determine their origins. Mark Warner, manager of herpetology at the zoo, said the python's eggs also were surprising because of the python's advanced age. He said the snake might be the oldest python known to have laid eggs. I love this story. I really do. A World War II veteran who recently won a case. What did he win? He wants his coffin, when he dies, to look like a chewing gum package. Yes. Sooty Economy, a 94-year-old vet from Roanoke, Virginia, has been granted license to buy the Mars Wrigley Corporation to be buried in a casket resembling the wrapping of Wrigley's Juicy Fruit Gum. Economy's love story with the gum began decades ago back at the front. During the World War II, chewing gum was included in U.S. soldiers' rations. Because of wartime rationing, Wrigley could not make enough gum for everyone, the Mars Company says. Rather than compromise, the company took Wrigley's spearmint, double mint, and juicy fruit off the civilian market and dedicated it the entire output of the brands to the U.S. Armed Forces. The gum actually served as a valuable purpose in the men's fighting rations, says War History Online. First, chewing gum releases saliva, which helps keep soldiers' mouths clean when brushing their teeth was probably less of a priority than, you know, fighting a war. Second, gum helped calm the soldiers' nerves. Cigarettes were handed out to them for the same reason, but chewing gum on some but pardon me, chewing on some gum was, of course, a more health-conscious option. Given the circumstances, it's no wonder Economy developed a taste for his favorite gum brand. Economy survived the war and finally returned home, but the man who came back from the front was the same as the one who had gone there. No, we're not talking about anything morbid. Economy just still loved everything about Juicy Fruit. So according to his brother, John Economy, who is 81, Sooty, would love to share his love for bubblegum by handing out it, it, it to anyone in the community. It served as a symbol for his mission to talk to people about World War II, the memorials, and honor the deceased veterans that died for our freedom. Sammy Oki, Economy's longtime friend who runs the Oki's funeral service, corroborates, saying Sooty would like to come in here for a visitation or just come to visit, and he would always bring a bunch of packs of juicy fruit chewing gum and put it out there for the employees to enjoy. He just didn't want to do that here. He did it at all restaurants, doctors' offices, wherever he went. But the cool part about this is, is that at first, Wrigley Mars wasn't going to let this happen because they thought it would be bad press. But soon... They received another email from the company. This time, it wasn't from a consumer servant's agent, but the president of the company himself. He goes, I had an email from the president of Wrigley Mars saying that they are willing to do whatever the family wanted to do. And so Sooty Economy got his wish. When the time comes, he will be laid down to rest forever in a giant pack of juicy fruit. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? When an AI trashed a human fighter pilot 5 nothing at the culmination of DARPA's Alpha Dogfight event last month, skeptics were quick to point out that the simulated combat is not the same as a real thing. Two new rounds of the event, one military and one from the gaming world, will go further towards settling this issue. 
In the DARPA event, the human pilot followed his training and established Air Force doctrine. This meant be wary of maneuvers that took him dangerously low to altitude and not engaging in high-risk tactics like head-on clashes with his opponent. By contrast, throughout the competition, the AI pilots were bloodthirsty risk-takers that acted without any thought of their own survival. Falco, the winning AI produced by Heron Systems, was the one that was most aggressive. In other words, the AIs played it like it was a game, whereas the humans treated the simulation like reality and would have crashed and burned in the real world. A better contest would pit the AI against an experienced gamer used to virtual combat rather than an experienced pilot. So the AI makers have risen to the challenge. You asked, you talked trash, we listened, nodded, and reached out to move her. Let's do this, was Heron's response. Folds of Honor, a charity supporting military families, stages an annual online dogfight contest in digital combat simulator software. This year, the winner will get the opportunity to take on Heron's Falco AI. Details of how to sign up are online with a new champion. Will a new champion regain humanity's honor? The gaming world, among others, will be watching. Not me. No. Talk about crashing a party. A first-year dramatic art student in Gotham was recording herself rehearsing for a school audition only to get upstaged by her mother who came crashing through the ceiling. How does this happen? So Liz San Milan, who attends the New York Conservatory for Dramatic Arts, was facing the camera as she sang Kindergarten Boyfriend from Heather's The Musical when she heard a crash in her parents' home in Denison, Texas. The stunned student turns around and sees the sight of her mom's leg dangling through a hole in the ceiling, along with pieces of drywall and chunks of insulation. There was this loud noise. I turned around and all of a sudden, my mom's leg is through the ceiling, San Milan says. My dad said, did you just fall through the ceiling? And my mom says, you're not going to ask if I'm okay? She was a little sassy about it, actually, added the student who posted the comical clip on TikTok. And, of course, it's gone viral. We laughed for like 30 minutes straight, she says. She was not against posting it and thought it was hilarious. The musical theater student who recently moved to the Big Apple told BuzzFeed she was recording herself as practice for placement additions when her mother tripped in the attic while looking for luggage. Right before she fell, you could see the irritation in my face due to her banging around while she knew I was filming, Sam Milan said. Then there are the wooden beams in the attic that you're supposed to step on, but she tripped and stepped right through the ceiling. She was shocked at first, which is why mom didn't make any noise or move around, but she is completely fine, not even a scratch. Father and husband, Lance, has been working on filling the big hole. That's a lot of, of drywall putty, I'm not going to lie. I thoroughly enjoyed the responses to my video, San Milan says. My mom has absolutely loved reading the comments and watching the duets. The distinctive Prinkles tube is being redesigned after criticism that it's almost impossible to recycle. The current container from the potato chip, uh, potato-based snack was condemned as a recycler's nightmare. It's a complex construction with a metal base, plastic cap, metal tear-off lid, and foil-lined cardboard sleeve. The Recycling Association went all Karen on this, dubbing it the number one recycling villain along with Lucozaid sports bottles. Now, Pringles makers Kellogg's is trialing a simpler can, although experts say it's not a full solution. The existing version is particularly troublesome because it combines so many different materials. Some 90% of the new can is paper. Around 10% is polyol, or plastic barrier, that seals the interior to protect the food against oxygen and moisture, which would damage the taste. But about the lid, well, two options are on trial right now in some Tesco stores, a recyclable plastic lid and a recyclable paper lid. Kellogg said these lids will still be producing the distinctive pop associated with the product. Simon Ellen from the Recycling 
Association says the Pringles tube has been a bastion of bad design from the recycler's point of view. This new version is an improvement, and we broadly welcome it. But, frankly, if we are going to stick to plastic lids... That'll just add to problems with the plastic pollution. People on picnics leave them behind, and they're always finding their way into the streams in the sea. That's true. That's a bad problem. The plastic lid does have to go. Kellogg says its packaging must be airtight, or the food inside will be wasted. The new designs have been 12 months in the making. Pringles have a shelf life of 15 months, and 3 million cans are made across Europe alone every single day. Mr. Ellen said the polio coated card must be recycled by the product would need to be tested in recycling mills first and that much of the criticized leucosade sports model mr allen says its unchanged basic design was still a big problem as machines found it hard to differentiate the plastic in the model and the plastic that makes up its outer sleeves how about hiring people let them do it. People need jobs, Mr. Ellen. He called on the maker, Suntory, to reduce the size of the external sleeve as it has the new Rabina bottle. The firm says it was planning to do this for the new year. Yeah. Hire people. A woman was attacked by an alligator this past week while trimming trees near a lake in Florida. Oh, Florida. The 27-year-old had been working near water near her North Fort Myers, when a 10-foot reptile ambushed her. Ooh, that's scary. Rescue workers transported the woman to Fort Myers Hospital, where she was treated for injuries to both legs. She was listed in stable condition. The Fish and Wildlife Agency contacted a nuisance alligator trapper to capture the animal and remove it from the area. Serious injuries caused by alligators are rare in Florida. And, oh my. You know what? If you're in Florida and you're working near water, there's alligators there. Alligators! Bring on the burgers. Thought of the day happens every night at this time, where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air. Why? Well, let me tell you, it's because we love the audience participation around here. Do, 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 do. Today's thought of the day is as follows. Why don't you think we haven't proven the true existence of Sasquatch yet? Marty, one of our favorite veterans who listens to this show, and we love all of our veterans who tune on in, says simple. Sasquatch is the all-time world champion at hide-and-seek. As he posts a picture of a Sasquatch stealing... The shoes from a clown. Hmm. That's kind of funny, actually. Moving on. Tim. Para involved with the instant disappearing and the instant disappearing of tracks, but thousands of credible eyewitnesses can't be wrong. Rangers. Military. People. Alex. Oh, here goes Alex Mistretta. He always does this stuff shirtless, by the way. 90% of the people that look for a folkloric version of Bigfoot that doesn't exist. You can't find something that doesn't exist because we need money and a lot of it. Too many people deny this because in reality, they don't want to find Bigfoot, don't have the knowledge to find Bigfoot, or they encourage or the courage to find Bigfoot. They just want to talk about Bigfoot. We spend too much time following up on sighting reports. That's useless. That starting an investigation with something that has already been happening with a subject that's no longer there. A breeding population isn't going to be where we can see them. Nicholas, because one has not come running down the ramp and powerbomb the Undertaker while the king and good old JR blow a gasket. Oh, that's a fantastic wrestling reference right there. Fantastic. Nicole? A combination of a lack of resources and fortitude on behalf of the researchers. They need to spend years in the field, not days or weeks. And that Bigfoot is quite possibly as smart as we are with better animal instincts. They possibly have evolved to stay hidden from the terrible, destructive Homo sapiens. Edith, many reasons. I believe the government has, but is keeping it a secret as to not scare off people from parks and such. Additionally, the Sasquatch are smart, too smart for us to catch them. 
And finally, every time someone does get a fantastic piece of evidence, it is poo-pooed away by the non-believers. Jeremy believes it's an interdimensional being. The beautiful and talented Annie Svensson says, We have proven it by eyewitness testimony, which I still believe holds up in court. We have nothing to prove, and all we can do is provide information. It's up to the individuals hearing the truth to receive it. Danny, because it was an inside job. Oh, wait, you're not talking 9-11. No, we're not. Come on. It's not the day to be talking like that. Grant, we have. It just hasn't been allowed to have public acceptance. Nikki, government's proven Sasquatch. They even have them listed on their specific hiking search and rescue maps as dangerous predators to be careful of when hiking certain areas of Washington state. They just aren't scientifically proven to anyone else. And why would the government keep their scientific knowledge about Sasquatch a secret? For what is the purpose? Scott, they com- consume their dead. Sean, I believe they are transdimensional creatures. Candace, smart enough to avoid us, understanding enough to leave us alone, a wise old beast. Andy, he's a spirit, spirit of the forest. Bill subscribes to the interdimensional theory. Chris, Sasquatch does not exist. It's Bigfoot, man. It's Bigfoot. Ron, because, Dave, you are really good at hiding. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Really appreciate that. We are thankful for everybody who took part in the Thought of the Dave on Facebook and on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. We appreciate all of your answers and insight, and we thank Captain Shirk for a fantastic SOR Newswire tonight. You can find all of the news at spacedoutradio.com. And, of course, to our Sasquatch hunters from Washington State, Nathan Rudd and Rich Germo, fantastic show that you want to go and listen to again on our YouTube channel where we store our archives for free. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at work, at home, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everybody participating in our chat rooms on Spreaker, YouTube. LGAB, Rev Radio, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club at our website, and at hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends, we own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. The Wu Train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we have room for them, too. Good night. Good night.